effort to bring a mesoscale system for the 21st century Israeli forecaster. We have heard here um, about the history here in Israel of uh, mesoscale forecasts. And this is a joint effort by scientists, engineers, and forecasters, and it's uh, certainly a long list of uh, uh, very good people working to bring this uh, into operations and to be a useful tool for the forecasters. And it's uh, Tom's uh, group from NCAR working very hard for it with uh, people from uh, Israel working together uh, very hard for it. Um, and uh, what's, well, the motivation of, uh, of uh, developing such a system uh, has probably maybe has been said before, but we, we are, uh, we, our region is unique in its geography. It's characterized by strong land sea contrast, by complex topography, as you, as you can see, and different types of uh, vegetation and urban and desert areas. And as you know, this results in complex mesoscale and microscale flows uh, that are also forced by wide variety of synoptic sen scenarios. And we need to forecast all those at all scales. The second challenge that we have in our area is observations. Uh, this hasn't been mentioned uh, yet in this session, and it will be well connected probably to the next session. So our area is uh, sparse in conventional in situ upper air observations. We have quite a lot over uh, Europe area, but very, very few uh, at uh, many, many times uh, over the area of interest. On the other hand, we have uh, surface observations that can uh, be uh, useful to some extent. I uh, remind here both the soundings, the conventional surface observations. These are, these measure model variables, the variables that the model uh, uh, prognoses, the variables that the uh, equations um, uh, solve. Um, and this, I will come back to this sentence afterwards. Uh, we have non-conventional observations that we uh, may take advantage of and uh, help us uh, in our uh, forecast or data simulation uh, process. These are, for example, aircraft observations or reports. These are, again, conventional type of variables, the ones that uh, the model uh, knows how to uh, uh, solve in equations. We have also satellite retri retrievals of uh, winds. For example, I'm showing here a sat um, AMV, atmospheric vector winds, or satellite retri retrieve sea surface winds. And as you see, they cover many areas that are otherwise uh, unobserved by the simple uh, conventional observations. And we have also uh, coverage over our area of, uh, with observations that are non-conventional, that are, for example, satellites uh, on board of satellites. And these are not the model variables, wind temp temperatures and moisture, but they are, for example, radiances in different wave in several wavelengths. We have also radar reflectivities that we can um, measure on the ground. And what we want, in fact, is to take a modeling approach uh, in which we can uh, uh, take advantage uh, not only of mesoscale mo models, global models, but also of the observations. This is a piece that has not been uh, yet um, discussed in this session. And so what is our modeling approach uh, in this uh, project? First of all, we choose a mesoscale model, um, and we use it, as Tom has taught us in his uh, uh, um, lecture, we need multiple nested domains if we want to use uh, our computational uh, resources optimally to go from the synoptic to the uh, mesoscale. Uh, we also uh, have in models, as was mentioned before, many uh, configurations, many different options within the same model, different microphysics, parameterizations for the boundary layer, and so on. And, uh, we don't just take a model out of the shelf, but in this project we are evaluating combinations of these different options uh, through the study of case studies of interesting weather phenomena uh, so that we can define a, a best choice that can uh, better uh, simulate all the uh, scenarios of interest. We also want to improve the global initial conditions that um, feed 
the mesoscale model, and we do this through data simulation. And we want to do this data simulation efficiently, assimilating all conventional and non-conventional observations, at least uh, gradually adding new types of observations in, into our system. And as uh, this has to go into operations, it's uh, not enough for us to run it for one, two cases and be lucky, but uh, we, we need to thoroughly verify it, both the cases that we run and also long-term statistics of how the uh, model performs so that forecasters can trust it in their uh, operations. And lastly, uh, we also want, uh, through this uh, project, renew forecasting practices. We want to use the mesoscale high-resolution information that, it, that is not available in coarse resolution models in the best way we can. And for the last years, at least the forecasters that uh, I work with, have been using only coarse uh, resolution models, coarse resolution tools, and as you will see in my next slide, we are here going into a quite high resolution uh, system. Uh, it's WARF based, and it's, uh, it's going into three, it's using three nested domains uh, up to a resolution of 3.3 kilometer grid size, um, and we want to, this way, include the most significant synoptic and both uh, uh, high-resolution res high weather. And uh, also, we are somehow limited by computing resources up to that resolution. Uh, as we saw, we can go further and further to high resolutions. And we, we build a flexible system in which we can use different global parent models. Um, like the GFS, the Met Office, uh, the German, the ECMWF, and maybe uh, trying to go a first step to, towards an ensemble forecasting system, as was mentioned before. So uh, how do we assimilate uh, usefully and computational inexpensively uh, these uh, uh, observations, the different types of observations? Um, we have chosen a, a hybrid strategy. Uh, and this strategy is built, first of all, on a very um, uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, data simulation strategy named Newtonian relaxation or, nudge, or observational nudging, in which we uh, nudge the equations towards the observations while we run the model. And we use an NCAR uh, uh, RALS um, implementation of it. Um, we have here Yubao that has been the main modeler developing this uh, system, uh, Dr. Yubao Liu. And uh, this, this uh, type of uh, data simulation uh, strategy is suitable for all scales, but in particular for the fine, fine spatial and temporal resolution. However, it has a limitation. It can assimilate only conventional observations or observations that are variables of the model equations. But we want also to assimilate the other type uh, of observations. So we are also running in this system <coughs> together as a hybrid and interconnected, a three-dimensional variational data simulation. It uses what is named WARF 3D VAR. Out of all the variational data sim uh, assimilation or, or all, out of all these uh, strategies that can assimilate uh, non-conventional observations, this is the cheapest, and that's why we have chosen it as a first step. And we try uh, to assimilate, uh, as I showed before, radiances and in the future radar reflectivities, and this is uh, quite useful for large to intermediate uh, resolutions. So the next slides uh, are dedicated to the forecasters, and uh, I especially thank uh, Yu Bao and Will Cheng and Yu Wei from NCAR for uh, the uh, figures that I'm going uh, to show. And in these figures, I want to show added value of the high resolution forecast, some of the added value, and also try to show new forecasting practice, and, and I, I, I mean, in the very, very uh, simple, uh, in a very, very simple way. And as we mentioned, as it was mentioned before, forecasters look into clouds. This is the main uh, 
the main thing at least that the forecasters at the unit are interested in. And here I bring an example, a satellite imagery of a, a cloudy situation of low level clouds. And traditionally, the forecasters, at least during the last years that I'm working with, will look into relative humidity values at several levels close to the surface and look how this relative humidity uh, tells us about the probability, about inferring uh, uh, some uh, that maybe there will be clouds. We are looking here at 90 70 uh, 5 hectopascal, a two hour forecast. And we have here the GFS global model from NCEP and the wharf that we are running at 3.3 kilometers. These are the values for the relative humidity. And we see that both of them give some uh, significant relative humidities. The values are different. The um, uh, spatial uh, pattern is somehow different. We see the higher resolution uh, defining the area in the 3.3 kilometer model, of course. And I want to recall how that global models do not explicitly solve clouds. So there's no saturation and we expect a forecaster to have experience with model specific relative humidity thresholds in trying to infer the probability of clouds. And these thresholds of course will be different if I have a high resolution model uh, sol explicitly solving uh, clouds. Um, this is if I go up to a higher level how this uh, uh, really you can infer low level clouds and uh, the, the amount of, uh, of the, the, spe the area goes and shrinks according to the terrain and uh, again upper. So this is the traditional way that I've seen uh, forecasters uh, uh, forecasting uh, uh, now these days even. And what I'm, uh, since I mentioned the mesoscale model can explicitly uh, solve clouds. Uh, we introduce here uh, another variable instead of the relative humidity. It's the liquid water path. It's an integrated quantity. And uh, it, it is uh, uh, an, a measure that can uh, uh, be used for shallow clouds. Um, and of course, it, it will be only zero when explicit clouds are present. So how uh, does this parameter look in our simulations? Is it useful to look at it? So here we have uh, our, um, a, an example of our simulations. Typical values for the shallow clouds are uh, really recast in this simulation. I'm showing here the sensitivity to two uh, uh, planetary boundary layer parameterizations. As, as, as I said before, we are trying to check what the best parameterizations where the best schemes are here. Um, they uh, are quite nice correlated uh, to the uh, observation. Uh, we can, of course, look again at uh, relative humidity values at the relevant levels, and they will, of course, give a hint of, uh, of this too and will be uh, well correlated. And if we go back to the global models that they are using uh, nowadays uh, at the unit, we see that uh, we have added value here, not only because we are a better delimitation of the area, but also we have a, a value or a variable that can by itself tell uh, the probability of uh, uh, clouds uh, without many uh, in, um, experience uh, in the history of the model. So this, this slide, uh, in fact, uh, summarizes uh, what we have uh, seen here. And so uh, maybe I've been too fast. Or I don't know how many time. I'm OK. So just to summarize, I have shown you a strategy for building a modern high-resolution operational system. And the steps uh, are that we have taken our identification of the atmospheric flow regimes to be forecast in the various scales. Uh, we have identified what are the available uh, conventional and non-conventional observations. Uh, we define our model domains and resolutions to correctly model weather within the constraints of computer resources. We also chose a suitable data simulation technique 
to utilize uh, the observations as best of possible and improve as best of, of possible initial conditions because our predictability strongly relies on the uh, reality of these initial conditions. And we fine tune the model parameters through case studies. We perform uh, and perform more and more thorough verification and try to introduce new forecasting uh, practices. So a lot of work is still going on and thanks. also at 3.3 kilometers. And these initial conditions are not just a downscale from the large, uh, from the coarse domain, but uh, observations are assimilated into the 3.3 domain uh, resolution constantly, continuously. <laughs> we, are, we are not stopping this assimilation, and we are just launching forecasters <coughs> as we need. Now we are doing it four times a day, but we could do it three times a day, uh, every three hours, if we wanted to. Yes, uh, one item that you haven't mentioned <laughs> is the boundary conditions and the influence that has over a relatively short period of time. And I think you have an opportunity here to really study that effect since you have such a focus on such a small area. There have been some, some studies done uh, by uh, Kate Kennedy or Kate Canaveral where they need very fine resolution model runs uh, for launch criteria. And actually they found that the principal uh, component of the forecast was driven as much by the boundary conditions imposed as it was by the internal physics. Right. And it was a very controversial result. But this does hark back to the NCAR studies that were done in right. the 70s that pointed to the problems. In fact, your PhD advisor, uh, Greg Anthony's made a big point about this. So I, I think as you do, as you proceed down this path, you'd be uh, really doing, I think, the global community um, a scientific favor if you um, study that issue because not many people do, and I think it, it, I still think it's a viable aspect of how uh, productive this exercise can be. Well, we have looked into grants <coughs> driven with different global models. We are also looking into the fact that if you have seen the domain, the larger domain, it's a very large domain, and we are looking into the fact that not only uh, as, for example, the review by Tom on lateral boundary conditions, uh, teaches us about the lateral boundaries uh, overtaking, in fact, uh, the domain. We have here a very large domain in which it's not that easy to keep it on track with the synoptic scale. And in fact, uh, Yubao is performing now uh, simulations in which we are applying also a grid nudging and spectral nudging, in which, in fact, the large scale we nudge towards uh, the uh, GFS or the, any other model. And, and trying to see if we can get longer forecasts without uh, drifting. Very short, Very short comment. We have studied the lateral boundary condition effect on the development of the cyclone in the north. Cyclogen, a very famous case of cyclogenesis in the north. And we have found it was published in the Journal of Climate and Climate Geology that the synergy between the lateral boundary and the lower level forcing of the mountain, the synergy is the most important factor. And uh, we used many, many different simulations moving the lateral boundary away, closer and farther. But there is some distance which is optimal. And I assume that's what you have to decide as you go operational with the system. Right. Okay. May I ask you a question? Or not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.